Hey, welcome to Men on Everything. This is our show where we talk about, about everything in the news. News, sports, entertainment. We don't mess much more, more with the finances because we're basically all broke. That's you know, Mark's, Mark's so broke he can't even be with us. No, actually, Mark, <laughs> Mark, Mark is tied up with his day job, and so he'll, he'll hopefully be able to join us if not later in the week for Men on Scandal. But at it's least true, to, Tony, that Mark has a coin-operated modem. He does have a coin-operated modem, and that, you know, those, that gives you an idea of the struggle is real, y'all. I'm just saying. The struggle is real. The struggle is real. So, lots going on, man. Here in uh, St. Louis with the uh, Moral Monday yesterday, lots of protesters, including uh, Dr. Cornell West, uh, Pastor Jamal Bryant, and uh, a lot of young people. And, uh, I mean, the protests that went down yesterday were basically everywhere. This is all in protest from the Michael Brown murder. And I get criticized a lot from people for calling it a murder, but it is a murder. Darren Wilson murdered Michael Brown. That's what I believe. If you don't agree, then start your own podcast. <laughs> Do your own vlog and give your perspective. We won't, we won't solve anything until we have discussions about things, you know? And the thing is, is it is, and I mentioned this last week when, you know, and I've always been of this opinion that if you, if you have to type out curse words, you're working too hard because if you can't make your point that you're angry without cursing, then you, you're not, you're not really an intellectual at all. You're not, you're not, you're not someone who has, who, who can back an argument because you're leaning too much on your anger and hostility where you have to type curse words. And like I said last week, when you've reduced someone to the point where all they can do is curse you or call you names or criticize you personally, they don't even know you, then you've won. Your mere presence is a big W. Mm. You know? I so that means. From the stage, a, Tony Scott. I'm just saying, man. But the protest that went on yesterday went on in Ferguson at police headquarters. They did that for four hours, the four hours being key that that was the amount of time Michael Brown lay in the street after he was murdered. Uh, they had protests at St. Louis University. They had protests. Here in the St. Louis area, there's a very ritzy mall called Frontenac. They went to Frontenac Mall. Uh, they went to the Shaw neighborhood where Von Derrick Myers Jr. was killed. Uh, there was a protest at St. Louis City Hall. And all in all, I think 58 people were arrested. But I, I, I think there may be some headway being made as far as, I don't, I don't know, there were, some, there were some police officers who were engaged very, very peacefully and very conversationally with some of the protesters. There was one police officer who got out of pocket, but he was actually removed from the situation, mm. which I thought was kind of huge. So, uh, but uh, that's what happened here. Uh, I know last night, late last night, picture went up on Facebook. Von Derrick Myers is the latest young man, 18 year old, who was shot dead by police in St. Louis City. Right in the Shaw neighborhood, and there were pictures that went up on Facebook of him uh, holding guns, uh, guns in his lap and stuff like that. And, of course, now people are saying, well, there you go. Which I, I can see people making that leap. But when you're talking about life and death, we have to be, even though as incriminating as that picture looks, and people will say, oh, come on, man, you just won't face reality. No, I am facing reality, but we're talking about life and death here, so we have to be very careful. You know, and, and I think that's part of the, the, been the frustration with the Michael Brown situation because, you know, our justice system, as flawed as it may be, is the best in the world, but it goes very slow. Yeah. And that's just one of the things that, you know, uh, uh, when it seems cut and dry to us, it's because sometimes we don't have 100% of the facts. We may have 98% of the facts. We may have 99% of the facts, but we don't have 100%. I'm not saying that Darren Wilson should not be indicted. I think he should be charged. But justice is slow. And that's just that's just how it is. It is. And, and I, I think, you know, we kind of, I like the way we do this show because we kind of bridge what's going on in the news with, you know, the times and the culture that we live in. And part of that uh, problem is the fact that, you know, we grew up in a society where we see law and order. We've seen law and order for the last 20 years or CSI Miami or whatever the case may be. And the case is solved in 60 minutes. And that's just not the way things work. No. There's, there's no there's no sudden, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, smoking gun or piece of evidence that was overlooked suddenly that just pops up. And all of a sudden we now know. Oh well, this is the answer to this case. It just isn't solved that way. 
So we have a hard time resolving that. You're right, justice does take uh, a lot of time on some occasions. But, you know, I, I said this before, it's interesting, um, you know, I think people are paying attention to what's going on in St. Louis and Ferguson around the country. I hope they are. Um, but it's not, it's certainly not garnering the same level of, of interest as when you have, you know, an 18 year old bleeding out on the street. Right. So I think some people are, are like, oh, Ferguson, people are still doing something there. And, and it's, and it's interesting because, you know, Lots of people have gathered there to continue these protests. And, and, and I, don't know, I don't know if you've had these conversations, Tony. A lot of people are like, well, yeah, the marching is, you know, yeah, it's important, I guess, but we need to do something else to, to move some kind of action. What would that be? If you're not voicing your opinion, uh, if you're not making your presence known, then what else would it be? Obviously, the yeah. other thing would be voting, but it ain't, it ain't election day yet. So well, no, I mean, the mayor, Ferguson, was just reelected, unopposed, mm. not that not that long before Michael Brown was murdered. So, uh, you know, and I've said this uh, on my podcast that uh, to me, if we're looking to make change and you want it now, then we should be looking into how can we recall some of these elected officials. Right. Right. You know, don't wait for the next election <laughs> if you don't want to. But, then start recalling some of these people. And, and, that's, and that's great. But that, that requires, to me, in my humble opinion, um, that's the same kind of activity that these marchers are doing. That, that's mm -hmm. an offshoot of gathering and holding people accountable. You know, it starts with the fact that we are all here on the steps of City Hall, on the steps of, of uh, the Town Hall in Ferguson or wherever the wherever it might be, saying that all of these people, these thousands of people who have gathered, have a problem that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. That's the way you do it. Yeah. So, but, you know, I think it's easy for people to say, oh, Lord, here we go, marching again, and dismissing how powerful that really is. Mm -hmm. You know, when I saw photographs on Saturday of thousands of people down, uh, gathered in downtown St. Louis uh, for the protest, I was... You know that that picture says a thousand words. And the thing is, is it is it is it St. Louis is pretty much known for not really partaking in the civil rights movement of the '60s and stuff like that. In fact, there are some young people who are who have been. One person in particular tweeted, "This ain't your parents' civil rights march. Have a seat. <laughs> Have a seat." And and there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. You know. Because the, these kids, for the most part, the, and I call them kids because they're way younger than me. But the, these these young people, let me give them respect. They 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 have really made some inroads in this movement. And I think you know, I try to t ask myself, what was it about this situation that really set them off to this movement that doesn't show any sign of slowing down, which is a good thing. And I think it's because they see themselves in Michael Brown. Absolutely. You know, they have been pulled over for DWB, driving while black. You know, they, they, these things have happened to them. And so it's very, it resonates with them more so than maybe older people. But I know older people who have been pulled over too. But these young people, they've got a lot of fight in them. Absolutely. They have nothing but time on their hands and the sophistication to use social media. Yeah, you know um, that's a huge thing. I, was, I mean, they, they, people using are streaming this thing from their phone live on the internet, Troy. And I was going to say, Tony, I saw uh, I saw something that uh, Councilman uh, French tweeted out. This was a few weeks ago uh, in Ferguson. Um, I think a carload of three or four guys. Yeah, and they ran across uh, some kind of police equipment in the street. They picked mm -hmm. it up, and the cops pulled them over. Mm -hmm. uh, alleging that they were going to steal it. Now, I don't mm -hmm. know how the end result was, but I was fascinated by the fact that I could watch the live stream of their interactions with the police from the car. Yeah. From what I was doing at that at that particular time. At that particular time, yeah. And and, it, and you you know it was it really takes you right to what's going on now. I I, I had this. Uh, conversation and shared what listeners were talking about when I had my last story on NBC4 when I did the talk around town and it was about what was going on the protests were just starting up 
uh, this past Friday in St. Louis, and they were going on all weekend, as you well know. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that, you know, we have a sea change in the way things happen. You know, Rodney King perhaps may have set off the fact that people saw an injustice mm-hmm. on tape. You know, with something that, that people of color have had to deal with for generations. Mm-hmm. You know, there there have been issues with, with police. Hours. There have, you know, been ongoing issues, obviously. Mm-hmm. But there wasn't really anything other than word of mouth that could corroborate what happened. But now when you see it on video, when you think back to Rodney King, it's like, wow, this looks an awful lot like what a lot of people have said they've been dealing with forever. But yeah. now it's even different from look look at where we've come from Rodney King now these situations are either playing out live over someone's phone or they're posted on social media mm-hmm. on places like YouTube mm-hmm. and not only are they viral more and more people get to see what happened but then a lot of people are going back and analyzing mm-hmm. what you know they they're picking the situation apart and trying to figure out where Things were having, you know, it's getting a diagnostic that you didn't have before. This is true. And, this is true. And I, I think it fuels people saying that this is this is not a bunch of BS. These are real injustices happening to people, and I think that's why this particular movement, specifically in St. Louis, is working so well. When you think back, even just a few years ago, that uh, Jenna Six situation down in Louisiana, mm-hmm. in my opinion, it was co-opted by. Uh, perhaps some civil rights organizers and other I think people want people want to be involved in a movement to a degree but just think Troy how how not, it wasn't that long ago of what you're talking about the 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 the, the thing in Louisiana the Gen 6 and, and and the thing is is it is it had we had even the technology we have now just a few years ago when that happened is like would it would it would have been a game changer back then? Yeah. I mean, back then, really, the only the only real voice of that whole thing, to be quite honest, was Michael Bazden. Yeah, but because because that event changed his career, it yeah. changed his his. I mean, he was doing Love, Lust, and Lies, yeah. and then when that happened, all of a sudden he became an activist and used his platform of of syndicated radio to reach the masses. And no matter what you think of Michael Bazin, you have to applaud him for that. But had there been social media to the level that it is now, you know, and it's almost frightening to think Mm -hmm. where the next wave of social media is going to take us as far as being able to cover things like this. It's, 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 it's it's actually in a way it's kind of frightening, but in a good way. It it is. And, 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 you know, I, I'm, you're right. That story was popularized and 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 the flag was raised by Michael Bazin, no doubt about it. But what was interesting at the time was it was that event was still co-opted. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I remember uh, there were two things that about that the fact that he broadcasted it that I thought were interesting. One, when you saw the video on CNN, you saw all these people flowing into this small southern town in Louisiana, and they were gone. Yeah. The next day. That's the first problem. It's it is it are you protesting or is this an event? Are you mm-hmm. buying a t shirt or are you really there to affect some kind of change? And and it was kinda of interesting after the march was over, I remember listening uh to his show, you know, he had a conversation with uh Frankie Beverly and Al Sharpton. And ten minutes after that that march was over Basically, they had a party. Yeah, and it was yeah. kind of like it's disappointing. Yeah, what are we? What are we here? What are we drawing the the, the attention of America to mm-hmm. in this situation? Now, fast forward to what's happening in St. Louis. It's a completely different animal. Well, yeah, but to some degree, though, because Saturday night there were people who were tweeting and stuff. That that the protest down in I think in the Shaw neighborhood in South St. Louis had turned into a block party, mm. and and I think Goldie Taylor mm-hmm. actually tweeted. She says somebody got killed, and y'all out there doing the nay nay, really? You know, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm paraphrasing, yeah. but it's like you know. So I mean, did they take they, their eye off the ball for a couple of hours on Saturday night? Yeah, 
Does that change the whole movement? Absolutely not. No. But yeah, I do wish they would have kept their eye on the ball because the world is watching. Absolutely. You know, and and and, and the opposition, they're looking for anything. So you know, and the opposition is saying, look, they're, they're black folks partying again. They just can't they can't be serious about anything. So right. you don't want to send that message. Right. But in a way, you do understand because these kids have been going hard. They've been going hard for a while. They needed to let off some steam. I get that. I get that. But we have to keep our eye on the ball. Absolutely. Is what I would tell these people or these young people who were doing the protesting and stuff like that. But it is it is inspiring, man, to watch it here in St. Louis and stuff. And the interesting thing about social media, uh, before we move on to something else, was the uh, yesterday when the protesters went to City Hall, they wanted to meet with Mayor Francis Slay. This is St. Louis City. And about 30 minutes before they showed up, the mayor tweeted something about, for city services, use the hashtag this, right? Mm -hmm. And Antonio French is in China right now. I, he may be back, but yesterday he was in China. And he tweeted back to the mayor from China saying, uh, the services that are needed are at your front door right now. You need to open it. Uh, basically is what he was saying, which just blew my mind. <laughs> because it's one thing for Antonio French to be with these protesters, which he would be if he were in town. But this man is on the other side of the world. He's in China. And because of our technology and social media, he was able to answer the mayor from China. That blew me away, man. Yeah, technology is, I mean, people need to embrace it for more than uh, selfies. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. And you know what, and to be honest, for a while, I, I, I thought that's all the young people were interested in with selfies, but they've taken and proven, proven me wrong, I'm happy to admit, and have taken this to a whole nother level. Brothers out there who are live streaming from their phone in the car being pulled over by police. Which brings us to another subject, in a way, was that family in Hammond, Indiana, who got pulled over. They were on their way to the hospital to see the woman's mother. She's driving. Her guy's in the passenger seat. A 14-year-old kid behind her and a, an 8-year-old daughter in the back seat also. They get pulled over for not wearing their seat belts. Now, I don't know what the law is here in Missouri, but I do remember in Texas, and it may have changed since then, it's been a long time to live in Texas, that you could get a ticket for not wearing a seatbelt, but they couldn't pull you over just for not having on a seatbelt. I don't know if that's the law. I don't know what the law is in Indiana. It varies from state to state, but they got pulled over and they wanted to see the man's ID. And he says, I don't have my ID because I got a ticket. And he reached in the back to get the ticket and they wanted him to get out of the car. He says, no, I'm not going to get out of the car. This is where... This is where perspectives change because most people were saying that when the police tells you to do something, you do it, which I agree with. But if you keep an open mind, if you, if you recognize that the world is not the same for everybody, then you understand why this man would not get out of the car because there was a gang of police there. And he felt like if he got out the car, he might die right there. And it's, and it's not an over-exaggeration. This is what black men live with. Black men live with the fact that if they get pulled over by the police. There's a, at least, and I'm not exaggerating, there, in, in, there's a 50% chance uh, black men believe, and tell me if I'm wrong, that they're going to die right there. There are some people that absolutely believe that this could be their last. <laughs> the, the decisions that they make in the next over the course of the next few minutes could be, uh, could impact whatever is left of their life significantly. I know yeah. people that, yeah. that absolutely feel that way. So, some people absolutely feel that way. And so, so I got in a little online debate with a man and he said, you know, if you, if you, uh, if the police tell you to do something, then you're to do it. Yeah, but your perspective is different from that of an African American man. Mm -hmm. Right? And, Failure to understand that that's a real thing is not actually uh, being honest with the situation you're talking about. Because not not and I've said this before, that may not be most people's reality. You know why that police officer felt like he had to break that window out. I mean, common sense would have told me there were two kids back there, so the man he ain't gonna shoot. It's not gonna be, you know. And if the man by the time the man reached for the ticket, had he reached for a gun. And then he pulled back into the front seat and sat there. Why would he wait before he came out the back with the gun, right? So, I mean, it's just a lot of common sense things. And we find out since that that police officer, the city has had to settle with people for excessive force uh, lawsuits 
uh, at least twice maybe three times, and another officer was there, and the city has had to do the same thing a couple of times for that person. So to me, it tells me that if I have an officer that we've had to settle three times with for excessive force, maybe we don't need him on our force. You think? You know? Because he's costing us money. We're not talking about writing $20,000 checks. We're talking about writing some pretty hefty checks. You know? There's a certain mentality that you have to have to be a cop. Mm Mm-hmm. And if you don't have it, well, maybe law enforcement isn't for you, you know, and for the, you know, and I understand, you know, the mayor saying, you know, he stood by the police and the police department released a statement saying the police did everything right. Well, you know what? I don't think so. How could this have handled, could this have handled, been handled better if that police officer said, I need to see your ID. He says, I can't, I don't have an ID because I got a ticket. And he says, well, what's your name? And the guy tells him his name. It would have been very easy to look it up. Yeah, he's got a ticket. He wouldn't have his license with him. Can he get out of the car? No. Why? Because I'm fearful for my life. Okay. What can I do to make it seem to, what can I do to, to make you comfortable in this situation? Why can't a cop say that? I mean, if you look at the situation, the man is with his family. He's got two minor children in the back seat. Why can't this cop say that? Why can't the cop, why couldn't he wait for the supervisor to show up? Why couldn't they dispatch an African-American police officer to help defuse the situation, possibly? Why couldn't these things be done? Why is it that you had to be hostile from the jump? Break this window out. These kids got cut up by flying glass. You know, why did you have to do that? What was it that we saw? Because we saw most of this the situation, you know, in the car. We were able to see this cop acting very unfriendly. So what was it about that 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 had him thinking, I need to take this path? And to me, it's because he has a history of abuse and you know, as far as being a law a law enforcement officer. And you know, there there, I don't, I think it's safe to say that um, you know police departments all over the country have they spend you know thousands of dollars of their resources for the kind of training that these officers to stay current with what's going on, right? you know, to have them psychologically better understand their jobs, right? how they interact with people. I mean, you know, so, but let's face it, some police officers get it right, some officers don't, and now it's bearing out. You know, this, you know when you see police officers who spend time with young people, dance with them in the streets, give them something for, to eat for lunch, uh, that is not a requirement by a police department that's a choice on how you work your beat mm-hmm. uh, and and the same thing with this guy you know taking a taking an axe to a window is a choice yeah that's true and, and, that's and, true and there sh- there probably are several other <laughs> there are other paths that could have been taken perhaps yeah to that's true so Chris, uh, Columbus Short is uh, in the news because he's been ordered out of his home in L.A. that he was renting. Uh, I guess because he couldn't pay the seven grand a month that it was costing him. Well, that puts an end to his live tweeting of scandal, doesn't it? <laughs> I think it does. He was he was a month over overdue. Mm. Do you get put out for being a month overdue? Uh, why are you asking me, Tony? I'm not asking <laughs> you. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. I don't. It think, just. I think you would have a little bit more time than that. It seems yeah. like, but I mean, yeah. we, we probably have to go through the the whole uh, right. financial situation. But that sure. does seem a little abrupt. Yeah, it does seem abrupt. Maybe he. Maybe the. They want that seven grand, man. Maybe he got someone else to rent for eight grand. <laughs> it could, you know, you know, you never really know. <laughs> Terrence Howard's in the news because they're accusing him of faking the debt to avoid paying almost a, a you know a. Almost five hundred thousand dollars to his ex. When a, when a guy's gonna learn, man, that you know you can't you, you try to hide money, they always find the money, man. And then the thing is, is that you know you're 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 the person you're fighting with will hire a forensic accountant, and those those dudes ain't no joke. Those ladies, the ladies too, by the way, but they ain't no joke. They will find everything, yeah. and then and then because you lied, the judge will make you pay for you, your ex's forensic accountant that they hired. Yes, you're asking for more money. You know, more, more money, more money, more. I don't know, man. That's the, those two things, man. Got you know. 
I mean, I hate to see anybody get evicted. Lord knows I hate to see that, but man, that's that's something. I, I spoke so about on my podcast. Coming, huh? though, wasn't it? Wasn't this huh? kind of a long time coming for him? I mean, it seems like I heard about this a few months ago. With what, Tarrant Tower? No, about Columbus Shorts of Park. Columbus, oh. You know. Well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know, but I, 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 you know, I hope that I hope he gets a second chance, and I hope he's learning his lesson. You know that you you, you can't you can't. There are consequences to your actions. Yes. You know, you cheat on your taxes, you get caught, you get a fine, right? Yeah. You you don't do what a judge tells you to do. There are consequences to pay. You know, you bounce a check, you got to pay an additional fee. There's always consequences to your actions. We, we need to know this. I, I spoke about Pastor Juan McFarlane uh, in Alabama who got in front of his congregation and says, yeah, I'm, I took money. I took church money, misused it for funds. I've had uh, lots of sex with church members and I have AIDS. Mm. And so they booted him out of the church, mm. but now he won't leave. Wait, what do you mean he won't leave? He won't leave. He refuses to leave the church. I don't know. He's not pastor anymore. But he won't leave. He won't leave the church, and it's like wow. he's not leaving the facility. He's not. I don't. I don't know. But he actually had sex with congregation members in the church. Which man? I mean, this dude. I don't know, man. It's a, it's a big old mess. So I'm wondering though, because if, if some of these these members of the congregation he had sex with turn up HIV positive because of what he did and he admitted to, does that make the church liable? Uh, I bet you they are getting their lawyers lined up to make sure that the liability ends with him. Man, um, you know because <clears throat> I, I, I can't believe I'm hearing this story. But <laughs> uh, I mean, there's so much there, Tony. First of all, get his ass out of the church. <laughs> Just put him on a dolly and wheel his I mean, butt out of there. <laughs> Can the, can the police department come by and evict him from the building? I mean, I'm assuming that he's like, I'm not leaving this place. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of like a squatter. Yeah. Get him out, you know, yeah. and then yeah. arrest him. I, I mean. <sighs> I don't know. Hey, man, in Orlando. Any more, any more good news, Tony? Dang. In, uh, well, here's one for you, man. In Orlando. Uh, this beauty supply company decided to have a free Brazilian hair extension giveaway. Oh. And it was free for the first 50 people who showed up. Uh, anybody after that, it was like a penny. <laughs> and, of course, lots of women showed up. Hundreds of women showed up. And the beauty supply store claimed they didn't. They had no idea that many people would show up. So they really had no order. So people were getting knocked down. <laughs> You know, right. kids were getting kicked to the curb, literally. Everything got all tangled up. <laughs> <laughs> and and the police were called, and the police sprayed mace. And it just got, it got ridiculous. You know, it, it just got crazy. And to me, it's like, I, obviously, obviously, I'm not a woman. But I, I guess the the hair weave thing for some is is the struggle is real, right? I mean, because I mean I don't know anything about hair weave, so I I'm assuming well, that if you get do I <laughs> if you get a <laughs> if you if you get a hair weave, I'm guessing that it only lasts, it only has a certain shelf life. Is that is that I, I know nothing. I'm very ignorant to that. Yes. So I'm guessing, and I'm guessing Brazilian hair is is expensive. Is it because I've I've heard of Brazilian hair? I've heard of the Remy. Which one? Which one is more expensive? Remy know. sounds more expensive, but I don't know. What do I know? Is that the one Remy Ma has? <laughs> I don't. Is that her own line? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, she's just got a jail. She might as well yeah. have some kind of career path. I know Stevie Wonder had a line back in the day called Weavy Wonder, but I don't. I don't know. Nah, just <laughs> I don't. No. I don't know, Tony. I think uh, you know. Obviously, the weave is is important mm -hmm. to some people. Um, yeah, and and I'm going to kind of take us off on a slightly different path because I saw something interesting just last night that kind of coincides with with in a way the va the vanity of people today. So I ran across a video of and I, I heard about this story in Africa 
in several countries in Africa, but this particular story was done on Jamaican television. And it was about uh, Jamaicans who lighten their skin. Yeah. And I know you've probably heard about this. So, 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 you know, people have been altering their complex. I mean, you know, we do all kind. We do plastic surgery. We do all kinds of stuff. So it's not necessarily news that people, you know, enhance their body in whatever way that they they think they ought to. But in Jamaica, in several parts of Africa, and I'm sure there are other places around the world as well. All of these light skin lightening creams are being sold, and people are going for a lighter complexion because they feel like it's more socially accepted mm-hmm. in Jamaican society. Okay, so people are using these chemicals, and dermatologists are basically saying that you know this is just you're ruining your skin. You only get one skin, and you're ruining it. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically taking layers off, uh, you know, and, and because, you know, if, if it's not a sanitary situation, there could be a fungus created. There are all kinds of other just things that could happen. The reason why I mentioned this story, and if you look on Google, for those that want to see, you can see this story. And it, it really does uh, speak to, you know, people whose self-esteem is obviously completely low. But... The sidebar to the story was the reporter was asking people questions about this in various places around Jamaica. And this woman was was giving her opinion on on it while she was getting a weave. (laughs) Was was she keeping it real? (laughs) She was way too real, Tony. Not only does she lighten her skin, but she was at the time of the interview having a weave installed. So, so it, it sounds like a like a stupid question, and it sounds like it has an obvious answer. But is that is that is that someone who truly hates themselves? You know, there <laughs> there is some sense that people do. I mean, I, you know, obviously some people swear by the weave. You know, yeah. Um, weave is everything, right? Weave is every Tony. I saw somebody walking down the street from the back. I saw two women walking down the street. They were ahead of me. One had a weave, had to have a weave, mm-hmm. and the other one, yeah, just like like a a ponytail and a baseball cap, something like that. You know, mm-hmm. not, nothing was wrong with her hair, but there was this hair, and then there was this hair, <laughs> <laughs> and I was kind of like, "Come on now, this well, is way too much hair, way but, too much hair." You know, people. I mean, you know, you see women who get I implants look, and look I like. I thought if I was near the zoo, I thought a, <laughs> I thought a lion got loose. <laughs> but then you see women who get breast implants, looks like they have like two giant beach balls on their chest. Yeah, I, I mean, but that's that's the look they're going for. People go for a certain look, makes them feel good, makes them feel sexy. Right. To most people, it makes them look ridiculous, but they they they're comfortable, they're happy with it. It's like when I see, you know. Uh, one of the, I hadn't been in a nightclub in the last time in a long time, but the last time I was in, I saw a woman walking around with green lipstick. Okay. It l- looks like she had been given, you know, oral sex to a cucumber or something. I don't know what the hell with that. I mean, it was just it just looked ridiculous. Damn. <laughs> and people would look at her and smile, and then they look at who they were with and just roll their eyes and stuff. It's like, but I don't know, man. I think that well, we've just come to a point where, and I I don't really want to criticize anybody, but let's just put it this way. Halloween lasts a little bit longer nowadays. Every year it gets a little longer, doesn't it? A little bit longer. (laughs) (laughs) That's the only way you can put it. I I, I do believe that people, you know, uh, want to enhance what they have. They want to stay youthful. They want to, you know, all of that. To me, though, when it's done safely... You know, if you're going to have plastic surgery, don't go around the corner and have somebody inject caulk into your ass. Because <laughs> you want to look like J-Lo or Beyonce oh. or Iggy Azalea or whoever. you got to go to a reputable place and, and have it. And, and I think, you know, I, I know a plastic surgeon. I've had conversations about this. You know, there there is an ethical point to a good, responsible plastic surgeon where they're sure. going to say, you know, yeah, I want to make a profit. This is what I do. I do these kind of elective surgeries, but I'm not doing my job if I'm not counseling this person on what the ramifications are. 
do you really want them that big? Mm-hmm. <laughs> do you really yeah. want it that big? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. think about it before we go ahead and, and do this procedure. So Yeah, yeah. So uh, as it turns out, uh, the, uh, a nurse in Dallas has uh, got Ebola. Yeah. And they're saying she got it because she was uh, one of the people who worked on the team that uh, worked with uh, Thomas Eric Duncan, the man who died from Ebola. Mm-hmm. And uh, as of this recording today, there's a possibility that there's someone in the Kansas City area who may have Ebola. Wow. Uh, and I say all that to say we, we need to be careful because... There are companies now who are trying to take advantage, saying they have the an Ebola pill or vaccine or supplement. One in particular says they got something called Nano Silver, and it's a cure and prevents viruses, including Ebola. Mm-hmm. You are being ripped off. Yeah, you you are being ripped so off. Some- if, you, if you think about it like this, if there were a cure for Ebola, this this news story about Ebola would not be an issue. No. If there were a cure for it, that would that would be the news. We've got a cure for Ebola. Yeah, right. We don't have a cure for Ebola. We don't have a cure for Ebola. So just apply common sense. And you know, even and Thomas Duncan was given a, a an experimental drug that is supposed to control other viral uh, situations. It hadn't been tested on Ebola. It had been tested on other you know mm-hmm. viral diseases. Sure. So you know. Um. Yeah, there's no there's no cure yet. It's, yeah. it's not something that suddenly, on you know on Tuesday, hey, we got a we got a cure. No, there's there's yeah. no cure yet. Right. And, and there right. and there is too much, you know. There's there should be concern, a healthy level of concern. But I think there is too much panic among some people sure. when they hear about the situation. Now you got to balance that though with you know this nurse. Uh, I think people are right in wondering, well, what happened. The nurse who had on the biohazard suit when she treated Thomas Duncan mm-hmm. contracted Ebola. And, well, know, I, I think I think they're saying that the question is because they said the CDC says we've interviewed her several times and there's some inconsistencies in what she's saying mm-hmm. in regards to how she put her her gear on and how she took her gear off. Mm-hmm. You know, and then there are some nurses. I know the largest nurse organization. I can't think of the name of it right now, but they said that no one has told them what exactly the protocol is. These hospitals, none of them have been told exactly how to deal with, with this situation, what to do, what not to do. They haven't been told this. So, you know, and until they get official word, they're kind of like in the, in the uh, dark here, wondering, you know, what is it that we can do to make this work? So I, I don't know what the, uh, you know, what the, the answer lies somewhere in information, but are we getting the information out there, I think, is the question. And, and, and yeah, the speculation, there's so much of it. I, I think there are obviously some questions that need to be answered. Um, I think the CDC is being careful about how they're answering the questions, and not everybody is satisfied with what they're hearing. Right. You know, I, and, and, you know, let's I mean, let's put it all on the table. A lot of people have asked the question, well, how does Thomas Duncan die? How does the black man die? But the white patients did not. Mm-hmm. He received a different type of medication. And yeah, I mean, there's so there are all these other infinite possibilities of. Calm down. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sit down now. <laughs> Let's let's find out what's going on, right? And 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 just I mean just be it, it, you don't have to add you don't have to inflame the situation. It's already inflamed. People are already mm-hmm. concerned. We'll find out what's what's happening, but there's no need to to you know like bring these other questions that make absolutely no sense into the situation. That's true. That's true. I want to well, give a shout out to Firestone, Tony. You might want to look this up. The tire manufacturer, Firestone, mm-hmm. um, there are some stories that are, are out there. You can look on NPR and a couple of other places about uh, the fact that they have a plant in Liberia. And one of their employees uh, contracted the disease in March. And uh, they created their own 
um, uh, treatment center right at the plant in Liberia, the woman died, but they were able to they're basically keep the entire workforce that's in that area uh, safe mm-hmm. because they built this treatment plant. They've expanded on, they're spending their own money. They've expanded on this, this uh, treatment center, and now the only Ebola cases that they have are ones that are coming in from neighboring villages around this particular plant. Wow. So it's a really interesting story. They've done what a lot of government agencies have not been able to do in Africa because they decided they were going to spend some money and make sure that they put a stop to the situation. So they, the, the employees, the folks that work in the plant, the management, they learned they learned how to treat patients with Ebola. They built this facility to in, for intake to take care of patients, and you know it's, apparently it's been working out really well. So wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's great. That's great news. So we'll wrap up here and uh, thank everybody for checking out the show. And if you uh, can share it, uh, post it, repost it, that helps out a lot. A thumbs up also would be great. Subscribing to the channel on YouTube also gets us closer to where we're trying to go with this whole thing. We also have other shows. Uh, Men on Scandal is our weekly look at Scandal, the TV show from a man's perspective. I've got a podcast that I do every day. All that is all located at Talking360.com. You can even subscribe to our newsletter right there. So It's like an amusement park for your ears. And your- That's it. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. You can so go to Talking360.com and you can be entertained for hours. Hours on end. Most importantly, at work when you should yeah. be doing some work. That's, That's the right. perfect time to be a Talking360. Don't get in trouble, though. <laughs> That's right. All right. For Troy Johnson, and uh, who is in Washington, D.C., I'm Tony Scott. Thanks again for watching Men on Everything, and we'll talk to you soon.